guys. Um, if you have your Bibles, open up to 2 Samuel chapter 11. We're going to look at uh, mainly two people today. Um, and uh, yesterday, who, who remembers a little bit about what we talked about yesterday? I know you had me in the morning and you had Kenny in the evening, so let's see. Um, Caleb was a big dreamer. Okay, that was in the evening. Give up stuff. We give up things. Um, so I wanted to kind of continue a little bit on that path. I told you guys we we're going to really start diving into those stones. And, I, and remember, as we talked about the stone, I said that stone represents something you gave up. You know, you get people who give up certain things because they want power and they want uh, stuff. And so the first person we're going to look at today is King David. I, I'm a huge huge King David fan. Um, of all the people I think in the Bible, when I see, when I read King David, I read of a man who um, did extraordinary things, went through a lot in his life, and yet God never ever took the title of a man after his own heart. And I thought that that was so awesome. So we're going to look at a sin that David committed that pretty much everybody knows the story. So if you think of King David, what is the one story you usually think of? Anybody? Without, if you don't, if you didn't open your Bible yet, or you don't have your Bible, because I don't want you to read and go, oh, that's what I think of. What is the one thing you think of? Adultery. Adultery. Anyone else? When he fought that bear. When he fought what? When he fought the bear. Okay, he fought the bear. What else? Anyone else? When he fought the lion. Okay, when he tried to bring in the ark into the city. So, when I think of King David, I think of, uh, kind of my girl back there, I think of adultery, I think of Bathsheba, um, because it's, it's huge and it, it really changed things. So, in 2 Samuel chapter 11, this is what we read. Then it happened in the spring, at the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him in all Israel. And they destroyed the sins of the sons of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David stayed at Jerusalem. So we're going to stop right there real quick. Where was David supposed to be? Where was he supposed to be? Out on the battlefield. So we already see in, in chapter 11 that David is already not where he is supposed to be. He's not where he's supposed to be. And here's the thing, guys. A lot of times when you're not where you're supposed to be, that's when a lot of things happen. That's when things can go really wrong sometimes because you were somewhere you shouldn't have been. Have your mom, have you ever gotten in trouble? You went somewhere, let's say your mom said, you know what, I don't want you going over to your friend's house for whatever reason, you know, I don't want you going there. And so you get up and you're like, okay, mom, no problem. And you get on your bike, you start riding and somehow you find your way over at your friend's house. Now your mom's looking for you. And now you get in trouble and you don't understand. But mom, I don't understand. Why am I in trouble? And what is what would she say in that moment? Huh? You didn't obey? You went to your friend's house and were you supposed to be at your friend's house? No. She's going to be like, because you went somewhere you were not supposed to be. And so we see King David is not where he's supposed to be. And we read on. Now when evening came, David arose from his bed. And walking, walked around on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful in appearance. So David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? David sent messengers and took her. And when she came to him, he lay with her. And when she had purified herself from her uncleanness, she returned to her house. The woman conceived. Sorry, I turned the page here. And she sent and told David and said, I am pregnant. Okay? So now we have a problem, right? 
Now, I, I've heard some pastors who go, well, why was David walking on the roof? Why was Bathsheba bathing on the roof? Uh, and, and actually, in history, it's actually very normal for them to bathe on the roof because it's hot in that house. So it's kind of normal. It's not like she was like, oh, I know David's going to be looking, so I'm going to bathe. It was normal. And so David walking around, and people were like, well, why was David walking around on the roof? I don't know. But he was doing it. And then he saw her. He took her. He laid with her. And then what happened? She became pregnant. And so a lot of people over there are like, oh, man, you know what? That's bad. But the story doesn't end there. Does it? The story doesn't end there. Then David sent to Joab saying, send me Uriah the Hittite. So Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked concerning the welfare of Joab and the people and the state of the war. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. And Uriah went out of the king's house, and a present and a present from the king was sent out after him. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his of, the, of his house, sorry, of his lord, and did not go down to his house. Now, when they told David, saying Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, "Have you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house?" Uriah said to David, "The ark and Israel and Judah are staying in temporary shelters." And camping in, in, in the open field, shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? By your life and the life of your soul, I will not do this thing. So I stop there. So the only person right now that has any type of honor is who? Uriah. David should have been at war, and he wasn't. Uriah was at war, got called for war, and he's trying, David's trying to cover up his mess. He's trying to cover up his mess, right? And he's like, go, go lay with your wife, go, go have fun, go enjoy it right now. And, and Uriah's going, listen, this is where the ark is, this is where Israel is, this is, that's where I should be. So I'm definitely not going to go over here. Because I'm supposed to be there. Uriah had that conviction, right? He had that conviction. And so what, what ends up happening? Does anyone remember the story? What ends up happening? David murders Uriah to the front line. So David murders Uriah. He sends him to the front line. He knew he was going to die. So he's like, go, fine. And he wants to cover up his tracks. Here's the thing. We all need people in our lives. And David had somebody in his life named Nathan. And Nathan comes into see King David, right? And so, if you have your Bible books, just flip over to chapter 12. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a great many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he bought and nourished, and it grew up together with him and his children. I, it would eat of his bread and drink of the cup and lie in his bosom, and was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take from his own flock or his own herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. Rather, he took the poor man's ewe lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger burned greatly against the man, and, said to, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, surely the man who has done this deserves to die. He must make restitution for the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and had no compassion. Nathan then said to David, you are that man. Thus says the Lord, God, the Lord God of Israel, it is I who anointed you king over Israel, and it is I who delivered you from the hand of Saul. I also gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your care, and I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had, not been, if that had been too little, I would have added to you many more things like these. I want you guys to stop right there. David, Nathan comes in, and I want you guys to understand something about a king, okay? You cannot just walk into the king's court or anywhere, just walk in, just willy-nilly. At any point, David could have been like, off with your head, kill him, kill Nathan. At any point during that conversation, King David had the power to do that. But Nathan walks in because he's got a message, and he's like, listen, this is what we see. 
This is the story. And David, and I love how it says, David burned with anger. And Nathan looks at him and he goes, that's you. You are that man. And God's like, I would have given you anything you wanted. I would have added to everything that I already gave to you. I would have added everything to it. But because this is what you want, this is what you get. David ends up losing that baby. That baby dies. And David mourned. When we give up something, some of us react differently. We lose something, we react, we react differently. Some of you guys have had great losses in your life. You lost family members. Some of you have no home to go to. Some of you are going through some really hard things in your life and you're willing to give up anything to have something better. A couple years ago at a retreat, I asked these kids, I said, if you could trade your life, how many would you trade your life right now for something better, something different? And all these kids raised their hand. There was one kid in particular that I remember because afterwards I sat down and talked with him. This kid was going from foster home to foster home to foster home to foster home. And I sat with him and we started to talk. And as we started to talk, he shared with me just how, how hurt he was because so many of his siblings had been adopted and so many of this and all that. And, and, and so for him, it was anger. It wasn't even really any sadness in his voice. It was just anger. He's like, don't I deserve better? Don't I deserve something? Don't I deserve a family to love me? Don't I deserve that? And so there's this, this part of him that he was willing to give up almost anything to get something better. So we're going to look at a video real quick because we're going to stick with our end game. And this is a scene from end game. He did exactly what he said he was going to do. Thanos wiped out 15% of all living creatures. Where is he now? Where? We don't know. He just opened a portal and walked through it. Oh, man. Oh, he's pissed. Thinks he failed. Which, of course, he did, but you know, there's a lot of that going around. Eh? Honestly, it takes the exact second I come to the building now. Maybe I have We've been hunting Thanos for three weeks now. Deep space scans, and satellites, and you got nothing. Tony, you fought him. I told you that. I fought him. No, he wiped my face with a planet while the bleak tree magician gave away the store. That's what happened. There's no fight. He said, he didn't give you any clues, any coordinates, anything. Uh, I saw this coming for years back. I didn't vision, I didn't want to believe it. That was you. Tony, I'm going to need you to focus. I'm not even As in past tense, that trumps what you need. It's too late, but. You know what I need? Mean? I need mean, to shave. And I don't believe I remember telling Tony. Tony, yes. Tony, Tony. Oh, I had otherwise that what we needed was a pseudo armor around the world. Remember that? Whether it impacted our precious freedoms or not. That's what we needed. Well, that didn't work out, did it? I said we believe. You said we had to get your kill. And guess what, Cap? We lost. You weren't there. But that's what we need, right? Our best work after the fact with the Avengers, with the Avengers, not the pre-Avengers, okay. right? You made your point. Just sit down, okay? okay? No, no, here's my point. Tell me, just sit, sit, sit down. We need you. Sit. Here you blood. I'm a bunch of tired old wheels. I got nothing for you, Cap. Without no coordinates, no clues, no strategies, no options, zero, zip, nada. No trust. Here, take this. You find me, you put that on. You hide. You see, some of us, we, we 
get to a point in our lives where we let our brokenness become something that makes us so angry and we're gonna blame everybody around us. I did it. I did it. I let, I let the thing of, of my past, I, I let that loss make me so angry. And, and I blamed God. I blamed everybody. I blamed anybody and everybody. Pointing my finger at the sky saying, God, this is you. This is your fault. And, and I want to tell you this because I think this is where we're at. You know, I spoke to someone who, who she was saying how she has these doubts. And, and I want to tell you because my whole life, I grew up in the church. My whole life I heard, God is love. God loves you. God is love. God is love. You want to know what true love is? You look to God. You want to know what love is? God is love. And I heard that my entire life. And, and everyone's going, you want to know what true love is? Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envy. And they're, they're quoting all of these things. And it gets to the point of love protects, love cares, love does this. And I go, God, where were you? In that moment, where were you? You weren't there. We, we become so angry with God. And we throw our fist in the air when we go, God, it's all your fault. This is all your fault. And, and you become, you look, you, you see Tony. Tony is the anger that he has. And he's going, you weren't there, Cap. None of you were there. And those of you who saw the movie, he moves on with his life, right? Has a kid. Trying to repair something. Trying to repair, to fix something. We lose something, we need something to take its place, and we're looking, we're searching. David chose to sin. He chose to give that up. He chose to hand over that stone. He chose those things, and because of that, there was a consequence to go, oh, people go, oh, yeah, there was, he lost the baby. No, it was even worse than that. The sword would never leave his house. How bad did it get for David? His own son tried to kill him. How bad did it get for David? His own son raped his, his sister. How bad did it get for David? It got bad. And people look around and go, but, but God still called him a man after his own heart. Yes, but he did one sin. One great sin. And what amazes me is we, with straight faces, we sit here and we believe that we can sin, we can live the way we want to live, and God just looks down and he winks and he smiles at us. And we want to make an excuse for everything else. We want to blame the world, we want to blame everybody else. And listen, I was there, listen, I looked at the world and I go, God, you want to know something? Here, let's look at this. God, I know this kid, he's a drug addict. I know this guy over here, he's a drug dealer. I know this person over here, he's an actual murderer. And they're still living, they're still walking. So you tell me what's fair. You tell me what's fair. You tell me why someone so good, so pure, who his dream was to be a missionary, he's the one who dies. He's the one. So you tell me. You, you see where this is going? We, we hand over something. We hand over our power. We hand it and we hold on to something that's alive. You guys have stones, you're holding on to something that's a lie, and we're sitting there, and we're believing that it's so much more. David held on to something that was a lie. He lusted after somebody. He tried to cover up his sin. He did everything within his power. And all he had to do was be where he should have been, and it never would have happened. But we want to blame, we, we look at everything, we blame everybody else. So let's look at another woman. Let's look at another person. John chapter 4. Turn. There's a woman. There's something you guys need to know about this. A Samaritan is not a what? Is not a what? Who said it? It's not a Jew. And if you want to know something about Jews... Something about Jews. 
that is still very true even today. Jews do not like Gentiles. They still consider them unclean. Still to this day. How do I know this? I have friends who have been ministers and pastors and, and have reached out to Jews. And they say all the time, Jews will come up and spit on their feet and say unclean and walk away. So even today, it's still believed. And so Jesus is walking through Samaria. He says he had to go through there. He didn't have to, but he decided to. And here we pick up in, in verse 7. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I am a Samaritan woman? Stop right there. Right away she recognizes it. She goes, listen, uh, you're asking me for a drink. I'm not a Jew. You're a Jew. How dare you ask me for a drink? Because you should know. Right? So this is what this one guy told me. He said, so what the, what the Gentiles would do is when they would walk by a Jew, and the Jew is going to temple, they would walk by them, and they would either spit on their feet or they would touch them. Because if they touched them, the Jew was now unclean. So you're walking, so you don't have cars back then. You're walking to temple, you're now unclean, you can't go to temple. You have to go back, you have to wash up, get clean, and then you can go back to temple. So they would mess with their minds. That would be me. That would be me, I'd just sit on the road. I'd block the entire road, fatherless. Nobody's going to temple today, guys. Nobody. And Jesus is going even further than that. Not a touch. He's going, share your cup with me. Share your cup with me. So if they're considered unclean just by touching them, imagine how unclean it is to drink from them. But Jesus didn't see that, did he? And we move on. Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. She said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? You're not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? Jesus answered and said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to the eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw. He said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have correctly said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands and the one whom you have, who you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is, that, is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. He who is called Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all this to us. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. You want to know something? Jesus stands before a Samaritan and says, I am the Messiah. You read throughout scripture, he doesn't say that often, does he? But he chooses to reveal to her. But what I really want to look at is her response to Jesus. She's looking for this water. He's talking about this water. He goes, listen, I'm going to give you this water. You're never going to thirst again. And, and if you really can picture her, she's probably not just sitting there having a conversation at this point. She's not leaning back going, cool, where's this water? I can see her at this point because, let me tell you something, Samaritans may have been different from the Jews, but you cannot be a prostitute and go and drink from the well and be around them still. They would stone her to death. And she's, you, you, you can almost hear in her voice, if you really picture her there, just wanting to know, just this deep pain inside of her. 
going where? Where is this water? Where is this water so I don't have to go through this, so I don't have to have the people stare at me? Where is this water that I get so I don't have to walk down that street? Where is this water so I don't have to come when it's hottest during the day to draw water? Where? And he goes on and he's like, he's talking about worshipers. And then she goes, well, that now there's a change there. Our people say you what we worship here. The Jews say we worship over here. So which one is it? Which one is it? This is a response to pain. You have pain, there's a response. There's a response. You break your leg, you don't just go, oh, I think I broke my leg. If that bone pops out your leg, trust me, Jason will probably tell you, he, he's a paramedic. Those people probably aren't sitting there all cool like, oh, dude, look at my leg. The bone is out, but it's cool. I'll just walk it off. I'll shake, shake, shake it off. <laughs> no, you, there's a response to pain. Some people go through anger and other people go more like four. Was the fancy bird? Thank you. 
Sometimes we, we look at our lives and we look at all the things that happen and we think that we're not worthy of God's love. I'm going to tell you, I, I, I was there. I was at that point in my life. I'm going, God, I'm not worthy of your love. I'm not worthy to be loved by you. I don't deserve it. Some of you are angry. You're angry at God. You're angry at your parents. You're angry at the world. You're angry at... And then others of you, you're just so broken, you don't know what to do. You don't know how to pick yourself up anymore. You don't know how to pick yourself up anymore. And you're standing there and you're going, ah, I just don't know how. I can't do this. I can't do this. And that scene that they didn't show, the mom said, the mom's talking to him and says something basically to the effect of, we all fail at being the man that we think we're supposed to be, or we thought we were supposed to be. We fail. It's what we do after when we already become the man or the woman. How do you react? How do you deal with it? I got one last video for you real quick. Um, I'm gonna set you guys up for this video. I do have another verse, but uh, you guys are gonna be doing it in devotions anyway, so I'm going to skip it, but um, this movie is called Wonder, um, and there's not many movies out there, like I like movies, but there's not many movies out there that I watch, and I'm like almost bawling like a baby, you know, because it's just one of those touching movies, but I'm going to show you a scene, and this scene is a conversation that the kid is having with his mom, and, and, and I'm setting this up because I want you to understand something, I love the comment and how she says it. And we'll talk about it real quick afterwards. But listen to what her response to him and his question is. Okay? That is not the way we leave the table. Hey, come on. Talk to me. Sit down. Take that off, please. Okay. 
marks on her face. I have this wrinkle here from her first surgery. I have these wrinkles here from her last surgery. This is the map that shows us where we're going. And this is the map that shows us where we've been. And it's a pattern. She says that this is the map that tells us where we're going. And this is the map that shows us where we've been. And some of you, and it's a very true statement, because when you look into someone's eyes, when you look in their face, you can see the pain, you can see the hurt, you can see what they've gone through. You may not know exactly what they've gone through, but I guarantee you, you look and you go, man, I know they've been through something. So where's your heart taking you? Have you ever thought about that? Where's this map taking you? Did you let this map become so corroded and so beat up that you're angry or you just don't know how to pick yourself up or are you willing to say, okay, God, I'm gonna let you draw my map? Let's bow our heads. Abba. Sometimes the pain is more than we can bear. And when I think of young people, I know that there's so much they were never ever supposed to go through. I know that there's many of them here, Abba, who, who, man, they, they, they were never supposed to experience that loss. They were never supposed to experience that pain. They were never supposed to experience innocence stripped away from them. They were never supposed to experience that. But God, what I've learned through the pain, what I've learned through the shame, what I've learned through the fear is that you're still on your throne. You still love us. And only you can heal us. God, this week's not done. And you're not done. Some of us here, we're ready to go home. Others aren't quite ready to go home. I, I'm telling you what I'm ready for, God. I'm ready for a mighty move of God. I'm ready for you to do something awesome and great here. And I know you've already been moving in some people's hearts. You've already been moving in some people's lives. You've already been touching them. And Lord, some of them will leave here not experiencing that. But for those who do, God, I just pray that it won't just be an experience here, but it's something that they take with them when they leave. For those who are brokenhearted, God, who are angry at you, angry at the world, angry at their parents, I pray that you would start to touch their hearts, start to reveal yourself more and more to them. For those of them who just can't seem to get up, that they're, they're busy being stuck on the ground and they just can't get up. They don't know how to do it. They feel like they're, they're in the deepest pit of their life. Throw them a rope. Because I know I know you're going to do something great. In your mighty name, I pray. Amen. Amen.